Do you hear me? Okay. In person, in the museum. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Gisela Carbonell, curator here at the Rawlings Museum of Art. I want to welcome all of you to tonight's event. Before I introduce our guest artists, uh, we would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Seminole and Pumapua peoples who have stewarded this land through generations and we pay our respects to elders past and present. This event is being recorded. <coughs> Tonight's event is made possible in part by the Thomas P. Johnson Distinguished Visiting Scholars and Artists Program. We're excited to have you here for the first public in-person event of this season and under the museum's new name as the Rollins Museum of Art. During the talk, we will explore and celebrate the exhibition Gallardo Budok, Growth, Breath, and Terrain, of course, in the next, uh, in the gallery next door, which brings together 25 works by two artists who come from different backgrounds and work with different techniques and materials, but who have a close and strong connection to the Caribbean. As you will see, their interdisciplinary approach to art making results in works that are beautiful, often poetic, fantastical, vibrant, but above all, nuanced and thought-provoking. Frances Gallardo was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 1984. She received a BFA in drawing from the University of Puerto Rico and an MFA in studio art from Cornell University. She has exhibited in venues in the U.S. and abroad, such as the Perez Art Museum in Miami, the Museum of Latin American Art in Los Angeles, the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña in San Juan, Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico in San Juan, and many others, and has participated in numerous residencies, including the Latin American Roaming Arts in Panama City, Caribbean Linked in Orange Star Caruba, the Center for Book Arts in New York, and La Práctica Beta Local in San Juan. She has created site-specific work, most recently the piece Line to Line, commissioned in 2019 by the MTA Arts and Design for the 14th Avenue Bridge in the city of Mount Vernon, New York. Her work is solid, solidly grounded in her masterful manipulation of cut paper and her skillful draftsmanship. In 2009, Gallardo began researching meteorological phenomena in the Caribbean, particularly hurricanes, wind patterns, mosquitoes, uh, mosquito flight patterns during and after a hurricane, and the effects of Sahara desert dust in Puerto Rico. <coughs> The examples in the exhibition attest to her commitment to what our practice characterized by interdisciplinarity and to the creation of works of art that can be evocative and beautiful work while encouraging the viewer to look beyond what is apparent at first glance. Welcome, Francis. Thank you. Nathan Budo's work is framed in the traditional in the tradition of narrative figuration and detailed draftsmanship. He was born in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1962 and attended the School of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. He later earned a BFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, a Juris Doctor degree from the University of Puerto Rico, and an MA in Psychology from the City University of New York. <laughs> Informed by his experience as a resident of Puerto Rico for more than two decades, his recent works address the island's urban landscape and the social, environmental, and cultural contrast contained in it. In his paintings, Budov strategically inserts creatures in context charged with cultural meaning, pushing the boundaries of the traditional understanding of our surroundings. <coughs> Placed in dialogue with each other, the works in the exhibition explore natural phenomena in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. Gallardo's lace-like cutouts relate visually to Budov's meticulously rendered animals, trees and foliage, creating dynamic and cultural related, excuse me, and colorful relationships that upon closer inspection reveal a nuanced approach to the cultural, historical, and scientific dimensions of the natural environment. I am very excited to welcome them to the museum after two and a half years working with them closely <laughs> together on this project. Please join me in welcoming Francis Gallardo and Nathan Mudo. And so for our conversation tonight, we're showing you some uh, images of works that are in the exhibition, and also um, additional images so that 
we can get to know their practice a little bit better. And we also have a catalog for the exhibition, of course, which you can get at the museum store. So to start our conversation, I thought we could start at the end of, or the culmination of our project. <laughs> As I mentioned, this is um, a project we've been working on for two and a half years, uh, which culminated in the 25 works selected for the exhibition. One of the works in the show, which is pictured here, is the only work in the exhibition that the artists collaborated and created together. So I thought we could start there and kind of walk back into the process and your practice. If you can share a little bit about Untitled Light and Beat and how this work sort of shows your collaboration <coughs> and working together, but from afar during this process. Right. Um, welcome, I'm glad you guys got come out. Um, so this piece was kind of like a great adventure for us, I think. Um, you know, we talked about doing something collaboratively, but really we didn't know exactly what we would do. Um, and I initiated the process by buying a big, big piece of canvas. I mean, in Tennessee, it's a pretty large piece. And um, drawing a series of bees in charcoal <coughs> on the canvas. And then I would cover them with a little bit of paper, folded it up, and sent it to Francis to see what she would do. Yes, um, but first of all, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Yeah. It's an honor for me to be here presenting my work along an artist who I, I have admired for many, many years. And thank you for the generous introduction for inviting us to to Anna and the Home Museum staff for the magnificent um, process of installation and uh, anyway, it's been fantastic, so thank you. But yes, uh, it was pretty funny because I knew that Nathan worked at large scale. So, so did I in some instances. Um, but all of a sudden I, I get this box. Um, I lay it, I lay it um, <coughs> on the table, and all of a sudden I keep unfolding and unfolding <laughs> and unfolding and unfolding. And it just keeps keeps going with her using the floor. Uh, and I realized, wow, I mean this is an incredibly beautiful set of drawings of bees. Uh, where am I gonna work? So I had to move everything in my studio and use the largest wall I had. Um, to, to fit it in. And so I started um, kind of uh, co-living with the set of ease, right, in my studio. Um, if you've noticed in my work, I tend to use a lot of patterns and abstractions and sort of data. So it was really interesting to see how this, um, these beads and this other visual language started permeating in my work and my imagination. And so I lived with them for, for a little bit, right? Yeah. Until I decided to uh, intervene to work uh, with this more like um, line work <coughs> that was suggestive of some kind of depth of architectural space. And um, I worked on it a, kind of a stencil, uh, using tape, projecting my drawing, uh, using tape, cutting out every single silhouette, and then filling it up with um, black. Uh, gold paint. It was wonderful to work with a medium that I had not used before, right? Because it's canvas, I tend to work with paper. So it was also interesting to, to use that other medium. So it forced me to kind of work in a different way, at a different scale, and yeah. with different materials. And then I sent it to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and I thought it was, in some ways I was surprised that Trent used the whole canvas. Because like my idea in some ways, I was like, well, it was a big canvas. The bees, as you can see, are on the left side. So I was like, well, Let's see how if we really work over each other, or if she wants to work on the right side. Because you know, we, in the whole, you know, we were talking back and forth, but it's very abstract until you actually start doing something concrete. So when I got it back, and she had completely filled up the whole thing with lines. I said, okay, now we're in it. You know, do the full canvas. And she also did some really interesting interventions, making little holes and with some patterns of holes in the canvas. But I don't know. They probably come across in the photo, but you can see them. Um, when you walk through the gallery a little later. So then when I got it back, I thought, well, it's gotten really black and white, and and also it would be good to have some kind of strong, you know, assertive characters in, in this space. So that's when I designed the um, orange and red octopus at the top, and I put a second octopus in the bottom just in silhouette. And, and actually by that time, you know, since the things moved along further, the project had moved along further, I, you know, talked with Francis about my idea and what I was thinking of doing, because I think initially there was a little bit, 
there's there's freedom it's like it's a blank canvas do whatever and then you know the same in some ways probably with the airport stuff it's like well that did something with these beads yeah but then it becomes more like oh i don't want to do something that's going to be you know um disrespectful where they work together it's a collaboration it's not just completely at that point like oh i'm gonna stick the shark in here and the monkey on the right i think you can see it in the process too you can see that i'm like carefully and painting over the edges of the beads like i didn't want to erase them although i kind of did go over the few a little bit but i just was very conscious of these beautiful drawings that mark had done so it was interesting to work that way because when it's your it's your work you're just like okay i'll just not take that and from our perspective it's the first time that we have artists who propose to collaborate on a work and submit it to the exhibition. The rest of the works I selected with them for the show. And so it was really uh, enriching, an enriching part of the process also uh, to have the artists proactively think of the, the way that they can showcase their work, sending that uh, canvas between uh, Nathan's studio in San Juan, Puerto Rico to Francis' studio in Ithaca, New York uh, during a pandemic. So I think the work sort of encapsulates or, or represents our current context and, and the context in which we all thought about this show. So I want to show uh, some of the works in the exhibition. Um, Frances was talking about how paper it has been or is one of her primary mediums. This is um, the installation formation, which is currently in the gallery. Frances, can you tell us a little bit about your process to create this piece and, and some of the meaning behind it? Yeah, and, and also the practicality, and just to finish with what is my thought on, on that large scale piece, I really, because I, I keep saying this, but it felt like an oversized letter that we had to fold, like really, it was a big gesture. And it's interesting the connection that it has to the um, mosquito piece, uh, because something that's really guided my work is drawing, also the use of collage, paper. Uh, and I think my own biography that coming back and forth from San Juan, just appreciating the clouds, the landscape from above, looking at landscape from my screen, you know, uh, helping reflect on all these elements that surround us. And I've always tried to have a dialogue um, with the cultural scene in Puerto Rico, uh, but when you're working with paper or a sheet of paper that is very delicate, it becomes difficult to ship it back and forth, as we can see. And um, I wanted to create a piece um, that talked about these other elements of, you know, of the landscape, like mosquitoes and the, those atmospheric elements that kind of also guide our choreography in this space, right? Like killing them or just like moving around. Uh, but I wanted to work on large scale. So I decided to create a piece that I could take in a small box and then install it wherever I wanted to show it. So it was a great way of, of working on our scale without you know, compromising the, the budget to send it back and forth. Um, so yeah, I mean, I pretty much created individual drawings daily. It was a great exploration of line work. I used different styluses, markers, to create these different gestural drawings because there is so much beauty in the actual images of mosquitoes. But something that I also think that connects my work is the treatment of these subject matter that are difficult to cope with. Mosquitoes are quite annoying, and uh, you know, um, and also you know, hurricanes and Sahara Gulf have you know very difficult effects on humans, on animals, on the environment. Uh, but I thought that an interesting way of talking about that would be through the seductiveness of the line, and also just like the, the quality of the work itself that is very evocative, kind of like an aura, right? Kind of something that you carry with you when you're talking. And it's interesting that in a lot of these works, you know, that there's uh, research that you do, you read, mm -hmm. you read a lot about, and mm -hmm. these mosquitoes and wind patterns oh, and yeah. all of that. Yes. Uh, but yet the treatment of the actual mosquito is very much imaginative, yes. sort of poetic. It's not a, uh, uh, illustrating yeah. uh, the, the actual mosquito, right? Which may be a little bit different, the case with Nathan's bees or some mm -hmm. of, of his uh, animals that he includes Right, I thought there was such a vast variety of images of mosquitoes that I just wanted to highlight like, their movements, their early movements. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. And then, of course, we have a selection of uh, Francis' um, 
hurricanes from her hurricane series that you've been working on now for several years, right? Yes, I think more than 10 years now. Um, I moved to New York City uh, from San Juan in 2009, and it was the very first time I had been experiencing the hurricane from a distance. And of course, when you have family, you know, um, in the distance somewhere else, you just pay attention to what's going on in a different ge geographical space. And so instead of having to worry about, you know, closing the windows or making sure you have water or food, you know, protecting the hurricane, I was just looking at these images, just consuming it. Also, that was the, the dawn of Facebook, so I could read a lot of the comments of people. So it was kind of like a data gathering. So every time a hurricane would come, I would notice certain characteristics. People would talk more about floods. People would talk more about uh, the wind. There were just like particularities. So I started um, just exploring the hurricane image in the archive of NOAA, right? So studying images from the 80s, from the 90s, uh, from the 2000s. And there were so many interesting qualities to the images that I started reinterpreting those through lakes, reinterpreting the Doppler radar image uh, with wave patterns. You would ask yourself, why lakes, right? Well, there are so many interesting patterns that actually come from nature, right? In lakes patterns and collections, um, all sorts of, uh, what do you call them? Yeah. Well, do you, I guess, a very fine in Puerto Rican lakes tradition. Right. There's actually a specific tradition in Puerto Rico that's in the western part of the island that's making a very complex mm -hmm. um, lake. So yeah. it's very labor intensive also, yeah. which is kind of uh, evocative of your process too, right? Because these are hand cut pieces of paper that then you overlayer with other Yeah, things. and I love that you talk about labor and time. I feel like, you know, the sense of, of Writing embroidery also marks time. So I felt like while I was working on these lace patterns, just it gives you that feeling of expectation that something is approaching. Uh, also, just the transparencies that you appreciate, you know, in the, the wind, the rain, the clouds themselves, the water, um, just just all of those things I thought were kind of resumed or, or sure. summarized um, on these on these very delicate images. I also was really interested in cutting out the surface instead of drawing it. I feel like I'm drawn to cutting because I felt like water kind of arrives in a city or the terrain is kind of moving through. And I like that idea of super crime, like just, just cutting through the, the terrain. Um, and yeah, I see them pretty much as just portraits of hurricanes. You can see that I use different colors, different techniques. I, uh, focus on different uh, line thicknesses and different wave patterns, and I think that talks about the particularities of every hurricane in a more nuanced way instead of the muted way of the Doppler radar or you know that type of that type of um, data imagery that we're so accustomed to. Um, and I of course name them after family members and um, <laughs> friends um, because I feel like the act of naming something connects with power. <coughs> And so if I'm creating or reinterpreting these these hurricanes, we might as well just give the name to somebody who is supposed to be and care for. Um, yeah, I think more or less. There's so much more to say about this series, but it's not here. Yeah, and it's interesting also that you know that Vanessa shared with me this probably at the very beginning, and I didn't realize it until the opening night when her family was here and we were talking about the naming of the hurricanes, because there are some in there who are actual hurricanes, have been named uh, by Gabriel and others. Yes. Um, um, but that there's that also that personal connection to the artist's experience. Right. Well, half of my family migrated to Florida when I was a kid. So I think also all these pieces talk about that biography of Caribbean people always taking like the Northeast route to the mountains, as well as like in the 50s, where I moved there. I mean, there's so many, so much connection to history of the Caribbean people. So tell us a little bit about these. These are two that are, these are not in the exhibition. These are uh, recently created works, right? Yes. I think I've, I've continued to explore um, the subject of the hurricane. And um, this piece to the right is titled Marla. I'm just kind of, my name was born from most of them, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I decided to, instead of uh, creating the work looking from above, where you see that the hurricane is going to the left, 
decided to turn it around and pretend that I'm looking at it from, you know, underneath. So playing with perspective is something interesting too. Um, on both paper and that piece has about five layers of paper and of work. And you can maybe see as well some of the pieces in the other gallery that I play with the, um, with the shape, with the anvil, um, because a lot of the work that we do these days is shared online. But I thought it would be interesting to play with the perspective and maybe people will think that I took a bad picture, right? And it's like in an angle, so you can only see the left side. And uh, the piece on the left um, is quite an interesting new series that I'm working on. It's just new to me. Um, but I feel like it's a higher air layer, you know, it's this uh, layer of dust and sand that gets lifted up from the Sahara Desert from the North Valley and travels all the way to the Atlantic and settles in the Caribbean and in the Americas. And I just started imagining first as a kind of like flying dust particle um, that would settle, you know, on top of the sand in Puerto Rico. So it's an interesting collage experience of sand over sand. And I was trying to imagine, you know, how that behaved, how that looked. And when I was at Cornell, I um, took advantage of, you know, the, the big university that it is, all the technology they had. And in one of my trips back to the island, I grabbed a tiny sample of dust that had settled on my mom's like, car in one of these, you know, summer dust storm um, episodes. And I took it back to Cornell and I gave it to a lab where they scaled it at nanoscale. So for the first time, I was able to see what those particles actually looked like. It wasn't just me imagining, you know, these, these like clouds or wind patterns or anything. It was actually the actual dust and that settled there. And it's, it's just interesting to also play around with the language of heat mapping. So I created these grids, so I etched the image on black paper with fire with a laser cutter, and then I designed these grids in the back, and I just um, and, um, color them with pencil, color pencil instead of cutting, because I feel like the dust is more like makeup, so it's the dust that's being formed over and over. So I think the process also talks a little bit about the work itself and the meaning behind it. And there are four of his series. Um, yes. That are included yes. in the exhibition if you want to see them. Of, yeah, um, so, of them. Yeah, they're so. So let's move on to some of the uh, public art projects that you have done. We're going to show you some of Nathan's as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell us a little bit about this this permission. I hope when I go back to New York at some point, I can see it in person. Oh, thank you. Yes, this was so. This was such a great opportunity for me to work at a larger scale. Uh, as you can see, a lot of the work I do is related to um, fabric, to textiles um, in the aerosol series. I'm more like playing around with the embroidery a little bit, square patterns too. And in this case, um, a Mount Vernon, New York is a town that was kind of founded in the late 1800s in New York. And a lot of folks from Brooklyn moved um, to Mount Vernon because they thought the rents were too high. And so they created a whole property, a whole town. They put pumps in to create a fire department with everything they needed there. Uh, but come the railroad, uh, later in, uh, in the 1900s, the town got um, split in two. And that created a lot of social turmoil, just like a whole segregation issue. So what I did for this project, I went to the library, I looked for the original blueprints of um, Mount Vernon, and then created a whole series of, um, I kind of like, I created a collage, I filled in the whole urban planning, the blueprints of the town with lace patterns, and I quilted it together as a poetic attempt to blend all this, all the parts of Mount Vernon. And so obviously it's, it's also meaningful because it's in a bridge that connects both parts of the city. And you also worked on a recent uh, yeah. commission for private residence, so tell us about this yeah, one. Yeah, I love this piece. It was This is a piece that's very close to the ocean, and also it was a great opportunity to work on a larger scale, working with um, ink drawings. And uh, just like, it's so fun to be able to work with the light, the way that it reflects on architecture. And it's a semi-public uh, park. Puerto Rico is not very pedestrian, so this is one of the few areas where you can walk around and uh, just see art. So I feel like I've contributed some art to certain areas. Um, 
of the city. Yeah. Kind of like bubbly, watery. Yeah, I understand. <coughs> so one of the things that I was, uh, I became interested in, in pairing Samantha's works with Nathan's is that it seems to me, at least, when I uh, started thinking about a possible a project, project with both of them, is that um, Frances, as she was saying, she tends to look at uh, these natural phenomena from above, from a distance, looking at the satellite imagery that we can only see on TV or computer screens, right? We don't see the hurricane the, word, the way that they show it on TV when, when it's happening. And in Nathan's case, um, it seems like a lot of your trajectory and your work has been, here are some, some images um, of, the, of the installation, but in Nathan's case, it's, it seems as if you're more grounded and then looking up. So we're gonna share with you some of the images of, of his previous work from that perspective. And this is just one other work by Frances in the exhibition, the Portal. Uh, which we can talk a little bit more at the end, but I also want to have yeah. time to go through uh, some of the other images. So uh, Nathan, this is an er earlier piece, earlier than the ones that we have in the show, um, public art project. So tell us a little bit about this, and here we are absolutely from the ground looking up. Yeah, this piece, um, and I'm trying to remember just the initial inspiration for the design. I think I was just kind of playing around because it was um, there was a big there, there was a new or recently elected governor of Puerto Rico who for the first time presented a big public art project and the project was designed to create a hundred works of art and I think she was budgeting twenty five million dollars for the whole thing and so lots of us submitted projects and I submitted a kind of smaller simpler design for this station. And they got back to me and said, well, we like the design, but we want to put it on the ceiling and make it bigger. So then I just kind of added all of the, I mean, the, the character in the center and the, and the birds, which are the Puerto Rican parrots, were in the initial design. But a lot of the foliage um, I added later because I made it this 42 foot round um, piece. So it's actually 42 feet across. Um, it's made in Byzantine mosaic, you know, which is made from schmazzi, from small, handmade glass tiles in, from, from around Venice. So it has over 500 colors of glass because the, one of the virtues of that glass is they can alter the color each time they make it. You know, they can create hundreds of blues by just changing the pigments a little bit. Um, and so this project actually, I, I, I designed it initially digitally because I was changing it. Um, then <coughs> once it got accepted, I made a seven foot painting, seven foot diameter painting. I thought it was unfair to give the craft people a digital image. It was kind of uneven. And then um, this guy's named Travisonuto Sonuto Mosaichi, who are based outside of Venice, fabricated the whole thing and installed it. Um, it was this amazing privilege to be able to, you know, have this very expensive and very exclusive process um, realized for your own work. Um, and it, you know, and when I designed it, I think my biggest feeling was that. Public art should be somehow for the public. And it was kind of in contrast to what I felt a lot of my colleagues around San Juan doing, where they were just making the same kind of work they would make in the studio. And my whole feeling with this is I wanted it to be colorful, kind of fun, um, playful, have like and a lot of different details so that somebody who was coming through this train station on a regular basis could keep finding things. I thought, well, I don't just have like one big thing. Somebody's going to be like commuting, especially it's kind of a suburban area. So somebody's going to be commuting, so I'll hide some birds over here, and I'll put like some mangoes up here. There'll be like stuff that details that they can keep finding and looking at as they experience the piece over time. Um, it has now become sort of emblematic, right? A lot of people who don't remember the name of this actual station, you refer to it as that. That's the one with the parrots in the <laughs> ceiling, right? I know. Whenever I go there, like the guards, there's like a, the desk there. There's always like some kind of I don't know if they're guards or whatever employees are always like, you made that? Oh my god, I'm trying to this. Because I didn't sign it. So no one knows who made it. And I think especially because I'm, you know, I'm not from Puerto Rico, they always think, oh, we must live in California or you know, Chicago or something. No, 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 I live like, you know, five miles away. 
Um, so then you have some, some influences, right, from, from uh, residency in Italy that shows up in your work? So um, basically I, I had done that piece and then I continued with some other work which had focused a lot on parents and then whatever, some other instances in my existence. And somewhere around 2011, I became really interested in getting back to that idea of looking up and thinking of imagining, of, of thinking of what would be the, the idea of looking up for me in that work was really thinking of what would be the things we dream of. What are our aspirations? Um, you know, I'm kind of skipping the most obvious stuff that's always in pop music. Just as a well, you know, what are our real aspirations? And one of the things that I was driven to was to look at these painters from the Baroque era, painted these extraordinary false ceiling murals. And I got a small grant and I went to Rome and I spent like about a month there and I spent two weeks going to the, this one enormous room in the Palazzo Barberini where Pietro da Cortona painted a, a you know, giant complex mural of fresco. And each day I would sit there for like four or five hours and do a drawing of one detail um, because it's, he creates a, like a false ceiling but he also creates false architecture around the eggs. They have a series of scenes around the eggs. And then in the middle, there are these angels carrying a crown. Uh, they're going to crown the Pope Barberini. It's kind of, the theme isn't the most inspiring thing, but the theme is. <laughs> so is, is this the, the, the inspiration for your bees, the bees in the ceiling? Or? I, mean, I, I don't know if it's directly the inspiration, but I definitely was intrigued by it because then you see there's a group of bees. The bees are actually part of this um, shield of the Barberini family. So, so La Cortona puts them there for the Barberinis, and when you're in that neighborhood in Rome, there are different things that have those bees, like there's three or four bees, because the Barberinis were you know, a very prominent family in, in Baroque and, and subsequent years in Rome. That palazzo is now a museum, an art museum. It's kind of like a great place to go, but it's not that well known. Like it's not nearly as crowded as the Vatican, and they have like a Bernini and a Caravaggio and this extraordinary ceiling painting that's like highly underrated. So I was just really intrigued by the virtuosity of it, the complexity of it, and also the kind of idea, you know, the idea of creating this imaginary space where people can, you know, let their spirits go. And it led to these paintings. Each of these paintings is nine by twelve feet, so they're a lot larger than they are here. Um, and there's the same basic aspiration, like thinking of our times, of fantasies, of memorable moments, of things that would be in your ceiling if you don't have, like, you know, if you're making it secular for one, because, like, whatever, I want to get into religious debates in my ceiling. Um, <laughs> and leaving out, like, love and food, which are kind of obvious things. So, <laughs> family and playfulness and memory and dialogue and things that are kind of um, memorable and fantastic. Um, and in this work, I really started more prominently to include drawing, include like working in certain areas in charcoal. I mean, particularly in charcoal. I didn't introduce the ink until later, um, which was something new for me. You know, I, I, it's relatively new. Like, I, you know, I, I was a painter for years when I came out of Chicago, and I was always drawing, but you drew on paper and you painted on canvas. And in this work, the, the drawing really started to take over, you know, a prominent role in combination with painted areas. So a lot of the things are drawn from life, like there are trees that I, you know, these bamboo I went through at the botanic gardens in San Juan. In the previous paintings, the trees are trees from uh, different places in San Juan or around. Um, I think there's two other, the two other main pieces of that series. So then I kind of got sick of doing like giant paintings. Like nine by twelve foot paintings are like fun to work on. They're really, you know, you can have a great time. You can do lots of stuff, but they're like impossible to have later. Of course, they're almost impossible to get anybody to buy because who has like a, you know, twenty five foot wall to hang the thing. And so I still have, I have, I've actually placed two of them by now. You know, one in a museum and one in a collection in Connecticut. But I mean, at some point, I was just like, I want to keep making these things. So I'd always been super intrigued by this series of work that is. The two pieces on the right are two of the pieces from a series of paintings that are in the Frick collection by Don Andre Fragonard. And the swing on the left is obviously the most famous painting. And the thing that most intrigued me wasn't so much the people, but the way he makes the plants and the foliage seem really alive and really celebrates nature. You know, in a time when you think back on a lot of Western art, 
the nature of the offense kind of either not present or kind of threatened. I mean, not always, but in many instances, but so much of the Baroque art, the Caravaggio, the Velasquez, it's all in dark rooms where there's no nature. And it's really in the Rococo, and, and particularly in Fragon Art, where these trees kind of feel like they're alive, like they're echoing the people, like they're involved in the romance, and they're, they're kind of in a dance as well. So I started copying them and drawing other trees with that idea, and that's really where was the origin of the work that's in the show here. It started with these drawings, I don't know, about 10 by 15 inches. And initially there were a lot of trees and then animals started creeping in. But I wanted to include them as an influence. And one of the factors that I think, um, you know, it's important for me to mention is that I'm all, I, I read a lot about, about stuff a lot. And a lot of my work is informed indirectly by learning more about these creatures. And I mean, I think it's a really interesting cultural moment because Number of these books, The Soul of the Octopus by Simon Montgomery, has been a really widely read book, and she's very passionate about the complexity and the emotional life of these octopuses that she encounters. She does an interesting thing in this book where she meets individual octopuses and she names them and she tells like their life story. She has a relationship with them over six months or a year, two years. Octopuses have very short lives. So a lot of times, you know, she'll meet an octopus in the Boston Aquarium. Have a relationship with them, you know, visit every month, they'll hang out. It's just the whole thing of the way she describes them, how they're very reactive, and very playful with human beings. Um, the other book on octopuses is really more about their cognition and the complexity of their minds and the kind of unexpected quality of their evolution as highly intelligent animals in a completely unrelated line of evolution. You know, they're related to mollusks, basically. Uh, they have no relationship to primates. Um, and the other book on whales and dolphins is called The Cultural Life, the Cultural Lives of Whales and Dolphins. And it's again part of a trend of people who are seeing a lot of sophisticated animal behavior, essentially cultural behavior. And it's a really strong argument that, that these things, that a lot of what they what many of these animals do, certainly whales and dolphins, is not like this kind of thing where they always said, oh, it's just instinct. You know, they inherited that and they do it because it's no, these are demonstrably cultural behaviors that are developed in certain groups and other groups imitate, and there's a whole process of learning. So I think that it's really, to me, it's been really important to learn these things for my own entertainment and knowledge, but also I think it's really important the way we think of the creatures around us. And, you know, they're not just some kind of automaton, which is the standard kind of way we're raised to think of it. It's like, oh, they're just animals, you know. They don't have the subtlety or the delicacy of the thought that human beings have. So um, one, one parallel that I see in both your approach and, and Francis to the things that you'd like to study and read about and, mm -hmm. and uh, incorporate in your art practice is this idea of imagining alternative ways to think about or approach things that are pretty banal and everyday or things that, that we exist with and share space with like mosquitoes or bees or these are types of animals, right? To try to envision our relationship with them in a different, in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole pro project of paradigm shifting in a lot of ways in both of our work, and that's an interesting um, shared point. Looking at stuff that, you know, you're kind of taught about in a certain way. And I, I mean, I would certainly, the books demonstrate that whatever I'm saying about animals is not my new and original thought. It's just kind of embracing things that are coming out of different places to try to present them in a different way rather than process them in my own way. And I think Francis is going to tell the same in terms of um, these things that, you know, we kind of take for granted, oh, it's a storm, it's terrible, this and that, but it's this whole phenomenon that has a whole complexity in the way the world works and what it means and how they're developing. So I'm going to uh, skip over with all the respect and your permission. Sure. Over some uh, some images. We can go back to some of these, but I want to, uh, <coughs> I included here some of the ones that are in the exhibition so we can go back and, and talk about any of these, but I wanted to leave some time for Q&A and I wanted to take an opportunity to show uh, your public art project that is ongoing here and, uh, and then opening, opening, open it up to sure. I mean, questions. Real briefly, I want to say another point I think that me and Francis share a lot of is kind of the 
And it's not something that I always did, but as a younger man, I was more impatient, but it's kind of an affection for craft and process. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, Francis talked about how time consuming it is to create these pieces and cut the paper and get involved in, you know, in different processes than in the instance of her work. A lot of what you can see in the painting is also very like slow kind of, well, I'm not going to talk about this, but why am I making these little tiny lines instead of just like taking a big brush? <laughs> well, because there's a whole thing that you learn about it. You know, there's a process, of, there's a value in the, in the product, but there's also a value in the process of spending that time with each aspect of the, of the work and letting it fully develop. Yeah, I agree with you. I think every project that appears kind of like Absolutely. So this, just before we end the, you know, before we go to questions, this is a project that I'm about like three quarters of the way through right now. And I think the photos are all pretty much the size that are more finished. <laughs> There's one side that's pretty unfinished. And it was because, you know, on the left here, is because in the pandemic, they couldn't get me materials. Like they couldn't get me red paint. You know, we ordered red paint. It took like three months to get red paint ready. So that will be worked on in the coming weeks because it now arrives. Um, you know, it's kind of a crazy project. It's like a four-story pyramid. It's right on the shore of the San Juan Bay, across from old San Juan in a town called Catania. Um, it was built for no good reason, apparently, by a rather corrupt mayor who wanted to make the project where he could siphon off a lot of money, I think. That's what people say. It's never really had like a practical use. And it was apparently, you know, and it was kind of a controversial project, but then it was just basically abandoned for long, many years. It's been a project for uh, about 40 years. And it, for a time, it was a library, but I, for whatever reason, it didn't stay a library. So um, one of the universities in Puerto Rico has developed a project, like an eco-touristic project to kind of um, you know, bring more attention to this area. There are a couple of big nature reserves in this town. And this is going to be one of the focal points. They're going to make it like a visitor center, an exhibition center. <coughs> And so, through the Museum of Contemporary Art, they invited me to um, paint the whole thing, and I developed some designs, and they approved the designs, and the designs are shown to the current mayor, and who hopefully is a very different guy. I don't know at all. Um, and, and, you know, for the last several months, basically, I've been painting these creatures and the background, and, you know, the trees onto this pyramid. I don't know, it's been a kind of crazy challenging project because I don't always often I don't always work at the scale, like never. And it's also really great to have this kind of public visibility. It's a very different public. Like it's funny. I'm up there painting and you know people are walking by and a lot of people that do exercise there it's kind of right on the waterfront. You know, they'll give you a thumbs up or sometimes they'll talk stop and talk with me. Well, because I know that's you and that's oh, yeah. San Juan. Yeah, it's four feet tall, and four stories tall when you look at it from like four to like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it's been a lot of fun and, and, and also, you know, challenging, interesting exercise. Also, the angle is kind of weird, right? Yeah. And actually, all the images are things that came up. We did, so I did some public forums with community leaders from the town, um, and they told a lot of stories of their. Their memories of their childhood, and so it's like the, the butterfly crane. Um, there's a duck on one side that's like the characteristic duck of the area. It's like there's a lot of wetlands there. So it's, it's been a really fun project in a lot of different ways. You know, and it's gotten me up early, so I've seen the sunrise over San Juan Harbor with old San Juan in the background, which is a, you know, a nice way to spend early morning. So we'll be uh, keeping an eye out to see it um, finished in the next two weeks or a few months. Hopefully two weeks, but at least next month, they say, barring you know, whatever. So in, in closing, before we open up the questions, if I may ask maybe a question that can open it, open up the conversation, we'll go back to our initial images here. How, how would you say, the question is for both of you, Francis, if you want to start, like how would you say 
for you, how has your perception of uh, Nathan's work and your perception of Vanessa's work, has it changed at all having, having your works together in dialogue in the exhibition? Um, I know you both have been in group exhibitions before, but this is the first exhibition that focuses on, on just the two of, of you. Um, I think it's come up in a couple of conversations. Um, I know Nathan from so long ago. Um, he always says that it's true. Yeah. I, I was a student at the University of Puerto Rico. He was my professor for several, several courses and painting and drawing. But uh, um, Nathan has always been very active in the contemporary art scene. So, you know, he's always been showing. I've seen his work also develop and change over time. Uh, but I think some of the most productive and, and nice things about the whole process, especially with the collaboration, was kind of an activating some kind of collegiate um, relationship where we would, instead of working in our individual studios, I started just sending him images of whatever I was working on. And then he would send me images of what he was working on. And I think that way, sort of, we, I think, well, I feel like you had an influence on my work because I had a clearer view or a wider view of Nathan's process. And I think when we are sharing more like the, pro the sharing of the process, how to think about how to resolve certain compositions, hey, this looks good, I can use this other color, and just that collaborative way of, of, of making decisions in the studio, even from a distance. I think activating that has been incredibly meaningful to me and very, very useful. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. I think it's been, it's been great to have a kind of discussion and just really Oh, so I'm not sure if his work here is too small. So maybe I should like, I think this thing needs another color in it. Because they're, they're all the concerns that bring you into the work and that, you know, are like the more conceptual concerns. And when you're working on it, it's just the work. Yeah. And you're thinking, oh, man, this whale looks really lonely. <laughs> what's, he, what's it about? You know, like, maybe I need like just a, a red line to, to frame it. So there's both the design, composition. Or maybe don't have <laughs> but um, something that just in the in the gallery itself, I think one of the most beautiful conversations are more of my favorites are um, the mosquito work, where you see all these like small elements, almost kind of the same kind of pattern going below, and then you see the small figures and the the ghosts of the painting. Yeah. yeah. And then that conversation there between the work just does something entirely new uh, to my uh, mosquitoes as well. And you can actually be really interesting about the characters. Of the people. Just like the, I mean, in that I would think a lot of them is kind of anonymous, and less important. The whole idea that one of the ideas in that painting is that the people are kind of just the birds mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the animals that would be in it. The octopus are really portrayed with just with hair, like a little bit of a portrait. Um, I think the other thing that I've been really impressed with are things that. Like I didn't expect as much as just seeing the color parallels. You know, when I, so when I look at, at my paintings on that wall, then at the hurricanes, there's a lot of resonance. Mm -hmm. and I feel like they're almost made kind of in concert in some way with similar colors and similar shapes. And so even though the work's very different, there's this whole discussion in terms of you know, color and I think even thought. Like I've always felt that the interesting thing beyond the obvious is that we both have an interest in pattern. Even though a lot of my work has, you know, big character in it, there's still a sense of pattern and design and line. That I think there's is. also a way of synthesizing certain shapes, right, and um, abstracting them. Like one of the one of the pieces that I think my favorite, or like I just feel particularly about it, is uh, the works on the Batmobile, where you work with foliage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at the trees, every single leaf is different, but um, just like but finding a way to just like make it feel and look and have that depth of the pattern of the actual foliage is incredible. And also, I think that it dialogues really well with the Desclavado sculpture because many of the um, patterns that I use come from lace, and lace is inspired in foliage and in the trees and flowers. And so it's kind of like a really beautiful, like circling like, uh, relationship. Definitely a lot of interesting connections, uh, formally and thematically. Mm -hmm. So we want to open it, open it up to to you all. If you have questions or comments for the artists. So Francis, you talked a little bit about how draftsmanship through this creation of negative space impacts <laughs> your, uh, your process through cutting. Uh, 
Can you talk a little bit about the role that shadow plays in that process? Yeah, of course. Um, at the beginning, uh, well, I think every piece that I create has a different aim, right? And you, you, you notice that in some of them there's like a density where there's barely any shadow or just the shadow is created with just a flat paper in the background. And more recent pieces, I've been incorporating the laser cutter into my hands. All of them I make first by hand, so I always cut a sheet of paper. But paper has this malleability, and also it's kind of alive, so you can manipulate it, bend it, do all sorts of things uh, with it. And so with the laser cutter, I was uh, able to cut with MDF and wood and create more of like a, you know, uh, an object and a relief that would create more play. In other instances, like the piece Gaudet, I used two sheets of paper and then manipulated it with pins to create this sense of depth. Uh, so I think it, it, it all depends on what I want to communicate with. But the shadows are really a beautiful and super interesting element in them. Um, especially also in the, in the cutout piece. Is that one that yeah. you're referring to? And also the mosquitoes. Yes. I think space is something I'm really drawn to as well. Um, the mosquitoes have three light experiences. Um, when you see the work without any light, it's totally flat. Even though I play with the depth of each mosquito, I manipulate each one so that they all have this kind of like back and forth movement. But the light is exactly the shadows, like given that depth and sense of movement. Because you see the actual cutout and then three different shadows, and that just creates the actual movement to all directions. Great. Hope that answers your question. Any other questions? I have a question for Nathan. Um, it struck me that in your work, um, the humans are either completely absent, or if they're present, they're anonymous. Are there any examples that are not here where that is not the case, or is that a constant in your practice? Well, it definitely wasn't my historical presence. You know, I mean, I guess even in the works, that in looking up work, you can see that there are people who are fully present and developed. Um, but in the recent work, I've tended a lot in that direction. And there are some pieces where there, there may be a small figure, but again, it's an anonymous figure, you know, swimming or flying. There, there's a few in this, you know, in this series where they're a little bit bigger, but you can kind of see them. But they're very rarely the, they're never the protagonist. In Google work. Um, and I think that was a conscious decision. In some ways, I, mean, I guess I think it was you know, almost a conscious decision as to like, like not look at people as much. Like, well, I've spent a long time looking at people. That's enough. These are amazing other beautiful creatures. They live with us. We should consider them. You know, something kind of similar and visceral like, as simple and visceral like that. And then the kind of the ideological ramifications like, well, we should think about the rest of the world around us. Maybe people are, are the multitude that are filling everything up, and these are the creatures that are, that are you know, that we should pay attention to also, and that deserve the space and, and the presence. Other questions? Yeah, Nathan. Now that you've seen the exhibit with both of you together, what impacts is that? Seen your work differently, or is it inspiring in some way? Well, I'll just brief what I'll say. So, definitely go back to work in Bay. And that's been, I moved to Ithaca, New York, you know, for some time. I used to work really, really big. In fact, I did remember that intervention I did in a huge building in Scott Island, yeah, where yeah. the pyramid is. I got on a cherry picker, good God. I mean, it was just that kind of about I was. And all of a sudden, when you move away from your home, it's kind of felt like you want to be smaller. So it kind of made, inspired me to go back to just working big. So thank you for that. Excellent. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a, a specific focus thing, but it does make me think a lot about patterns. You know, because there's certain pieces in the last few years that I've worked on where I really think about like the patterns of things. And, and I guess the foliage would be the closest, and the pieces are very solid there. But there's, there are other times where I've been interested in kind of the patterns of water flow or the patterns of rivers, you know, over a landscape. Stuff that probably 
more similar in the sense that they're kind of more macro views than, than what Francis says. And you know, I think I kind of want to rescue some of that feeling that, that when we think of life and different life forms beyond, you know, in the natural context, a lot of times it's kind of it can be the creatures themselves, but it can also be the patterns of how of geology and of how forests, you know, develop in a given space. And I think you know, Francis works so much with that kind of a view that it kind of sparks my interest and integrates that back into the work. Any final questions? Curiosity comments. <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, that first painting, you used several different themes. And two questions, really. Did each of you solely stick with your own special media? And the other question is, having done that picture, do either of you think you'll try the others again? I, that, he, he sent that canvas, and I thought that was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I work with paper all the time. It's lightweight, it's not clumsy like a huge piece of fabric, you know. That I, I'm kind of small, you know, so I had to get this ladder in and like help with like how am I putting this in the wall? And you that was I like you know, that. <laughs> oh, you're not talking to that one. Yeah, but I did live with it for a little bit, and that was one of the challenges because I've not worked with canvas in so long. But it's interesting how I kind of use my own language of cutting to intervene the work because what I did was I made my drawing, which line work is one of my guiding guiding lights and all that. But uh, what I did was I made a small scale drawing and then you know I edited it so that it would work with um, Nathan's piece. I projected it and then I I just it created a sense a stencil. It took forever to do. Uh, so I used my skills in order to be able to dialogue with the materials that he had given to me. So I won't say that it's a walk in the park. It's not the time. Uh, but it was really fun, and I, I love the challenge. And I think it came out really interesting. So I, I do have a couple of canvases that I have in the studio now because I want to keep working with canvas. So yes, great. I know, I think that. I definitely work with stuff that I usually work with. You know, I worked with charcoal, and then I worked with, um, you know, white acrylic, and it, it, there's a particular shellac, shellac-based ink that I use a lot. It's, you know, not a very common material. And so I, I pretty much stuck with those on that, but I think the applique was really intriguing. Like the, last piece of, the last piece of the development of that painting was this kind of uh, almost net that Francis cut. Yeah, I, I ordered some wool, some felt, um, and I cut out that shape. But the piece was already in Nathan's studio. So I said, Nathan, you're going to have to be my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did send it in a way that was ready to just put that on. But I love the whole idea of engineering it, like trying to figure out the best way to send something so that it's user friendly. I just love that whole thought process. And um, I sent him a mock up of where I wanted it. Uh, he agreed that it looked good there as well. Yeah, I mean, even that process we actually talked about. Like, yes. We sent a mock up and we made a few versions, moving it just a little bit, and then the final. So I had the mock up like on my laptop. The colors is. is I had to go buy um, a specific glue, and uh, you know, had to kind of try to figure out how to stick it on this lemon. And you know, it took a, a little while, not too long, a few hours. But I mean, I really like that process. It actually does make me think of, you know, adding some applied stuff to canvases because it creates like another, it just creates a little bit of a space. Like having it be something stuck on as opposed to be painted on gives it a little feeling of relief. Of, relief. You know, of relief. So I think that there are some interesting experiments that come out of it. I don't know if I'll start cutting paper though. <laughs> And in terms of the process, I, I um, in closing, if there are no other questions, and I think we're at time uh, to close the museum, but um, you know, it has been an amazing experience for me and for us as a museum and as a curatorial team to work with both of you because as they are sharing this with you, you know, they were sending me pictures, Francis sent me pictures of the 
felt material and the color, and Nathan was sending me pictures of some of the uh, works as he, he was um, finishing them and talking about the exhibition, how we would lay it out, what color we would paint the walls, if we were going to use color. Um, and we have many meetings over Zoom and in person before the pandemic, and then uh, over text messages and emails. Uh, so this has been really a collaboration between two artists and, um, and, and, our, and me and here at the museum. So I want to thank you both for your amazing works, for being so gracious with your, with your creativity and your time, and for sharing the process, not just the finalized work, but for including me in the process to get the exhibition and the works to where they are. So thank you both so much. Thank you all of you for coming tonight, and we hope to see you very soon at our next in-person event.